You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. At Veg Your Best, I want to help you. I want to help you limit and eliminate the consumption of animal products without feeling deprived, overwhelmed, or unsupported, even if no one you know is vegan. My name's Michelle Olander. I'm a life coach. And I know that if I could go vegan in my 50s, With all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction too. Veg your best, and there's nothing you can't do. Episode 150, right here, right now, right here, right now. This is your life, right here, right now, right here, right now. Do you recognize that? That's it's a it's a blast from the past, but that's Angela Bassett's voice from the movie Strange Days. Uh, it's the clip that Fat Boy Slim made famous by sampling for his huge dance hit of the same name. Oh, this is your life, right here, right now, right here, right now, right here, right now, right here, right now, and it was a great dance tune. It was a great movie. And I want us today on episode 150 of Veg Your Best, I want us to take a minute to think mid-year 2023, right here, right now, where are you? Where are you right here, right now on your, on your vegan journey? Where are you on your journey to whatever result or outcome it is that you've been saying? that you want right here, right now, mid-year 2023. Now, if you listen to this podcast, it might be the changes you want to make in the way, uh, the way you orient your life to buy or consume things that do not harm animals. But maybe you've got that part down and you've got another goal. For example, uh, where are you on your journey towards enjoying time with friends and family who maybe quite, you know, aren't quite psyched about your vegan ideals or your plant-based choices? Where are you with your creative or your business goal? Where are you in terms of living the way you want to live? Maybe your focus has been on health outcomes, maybe moving away from vegan junk food towards a whole food plant-based diet, or maybe it's moving more. Your goals the outcomes you're trying to create, these are unique. These are unique to you. So whatever, whatever you are measuring, whatever you are looking for, just, just think for a quick minute. Where are you? Where are you on that road, on that road towards that goal or the outcome you visualized? Maybe you visualized it years ago, or maybe it was your goal at uh, at New Year's, where do you think you are? Right here, right now. And then I want you to ask yourself if you're cool with it. Are you satisfied with where you are? Or do you think you should be somewhere else? Do you think you should be further along? Do you think you should be better at certain skills or seeing different results or on to the next goal by now. I've had some new people reaching out to me over the past couple of weeks because they think they think they should be further along. They think that they should have uh, they should have a few of these things handled by now that were on their list six months ago. Um, they were thinking they could do it. They could make it happen, but it's July and now they're thinking, that they should be somewhere else. They should be doing something different. They think they should be somewhere else on their vegan journey, on their weight loss journey, maybe on their goal to up-level their plant-based eating, to be in compliance with a physician's recommendations. Some people think they should have made more progress by now on learning to 
meal plan or travel as a vegan or cook or read or write or learn Portuguese or finish a degree or complete one of those online courses they signed up for. And I think that this is just how we are, you know, this is just how we are as humans with the brains we've evolved. We think we should be further along in relation to where it is we want to be someday in the future at some point, because that's the problem that comes up with goals. Even if you have one of those, one of those smart goals that people are always on about, you know, that acronym, SMART, S-M-A-R-T, SMART goals, specific, measurable, um, assignable, realistic, time-related S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, assignable, realistic, time-related. Even if you've got one of those Tim Ferriss, Tony Robbins approved goals, at some point you have that thought, uh, I should be further along. I should really be better at this by now. Gosh, I've been at this quite a while. I'm not making much progress. And the thing is, Thoughts like that create feelings in you right now. A feeling in the here and the now, the only place that you and I have any power at all is right here and right now. So that feeling that you shouldn't be where you are, that you should be further, better, thinner, lower cholesterol, bigger bank balance, cleaner kitchen, a finished manuscript, that thought creates a feeling like frustration, disappointment, maybe apathy, or as one client of mine calls it, checked outedness or self-loathing. And maybe we're fixating on the economy or blaming others or rationalizing, feeling defensive, feeling victimized. And when we use feelings like those, frustration, sadness, apathy, disappointment, blame, defensiveness. When we have feelings like those, they fuel actions right now. And they are not typically the actions that are in the best interest of our growth. We don't do the things that will get us closer to our desired outcomes when we're feeling disappointment, sadness defensiveness, victimized. We end up taking, giving up actions, desperation actions, avoidance actions, hand in the air, avoidance actions, or F it all actions. So our thoughts about where we should be and how we should be there by now, or at least closer, closer to that future goal, our thoughts about where we are right now right here, they make a difference in our actions. Our thoughts impact how we show up. Our thoughts fuel how we show up in the world. And that fuel can be high octane if they're powerful, energetic thoughts. And they can also be watered down thoughts that dampen down our actions. Now, your goals, the results you want, the outcomes that you've been hoping for, they aren't one and done, right? They are not one of those pull an all-nighter type goals. Neither are your vegan goals. That's why that cliche exists, vegan journey. It's actually right on the money. Your vegan journey, it's not one and done. It's made up of lots of decisions, lots of actions in the right here and the right now. Any outcome that you're excited about, it's not one and done. It's a practice. And if you listen to this podcast, you know that practice is the term I personally prefer, like a, like a yoga practice or a meditation practice. It's a way of living right here, right now. So what if we practice shifting our focus from that future outcome to right now? And uh, that is not always my strong suit either. (laughs) 
It's not. I've I've quit more things than you've probably even started. I think that's a line from an old TV show, King of the Hill. I didn't quit on people or things people needed from me, not often anyway, but I quit on me bunches. I quit on all sorts of goals and plans. And you know the difference between what I stuck with and what I quit for most of my life was that when it got hard, and it always gets hard at some point, when it got hard, if I thought my goal was practical or useful or beneficial for my family, I could stick with it. But if my goal was something that seemed to require me to practice taking time and making choices that did not have obvious benefits for my husband or family, I usually quit. Now, I sometimes got something out of it before I quit, but I quit on me a lot. So that's why that line seems like it was written just for me by Mike Judge. I've quit more things than you've even started. Now, even when I finally did commit to my vegan practice, the excuse I used to get myself to commit was that it would help my husband's health if he significantly cut back on uh, meat, dairy, eggs, etc. You know, it didn't really make any sense that he should move away from uh, animal products and I would be a committed vegan, okay? But for some somewhere in the in my brain, it gave me the ability to give myself permission to change things up because it wasn't going to be one and done. It wasn't going to be, oh, phew, I did it, now I'm vegan. No, no, it was a practice of approaching every choice. It was a practice of looking for ways to no longer consume animal products here and here and there and here from that day on. Now, if I had focused on Uh, that I'd be a vegan coach or someone who hadn't eaten any animal products for years and years or had a vegan podcast with 150 consecutive weekly episodes. Okay, not only would I have absolutely not believed it to be a thing, aside from that, if I had focused on that sort of an end result, I don't think it would have worked. Because my vegan journey, your vegan journey, it's like every other journey you take. Now, you do make a plan, right? You set an intention of what direction you want to go in, and then life. Then life, other people, weather, laws of physics, viruses, supply chain, stuff comes up. So you set an intention to drive to work, or you book a train between cities. You have a process. You do your best, right? You look at a map. uh, You put the destination into... Google Maps, you reserve the ticket online, and then it tells you when to be at which station. And all that seems clear enough. And then, real life. If you follow my Instagram, you may have seen that back in May, uh, May 21st, I'll never forget the date. May 21st, my husband and I had tickets. We splashed out for first class tickets on a train from Berwick-on-Tweed in the north of England to London. First class meant getting assigned seats, a little lunch. They have these chickpea salad wraps, or at least they did, that we have, uh, we have enjoyed before, and, in, and it was going to be our lunch plan. So at 1.30 p.m., when the train pulled up and the train doors opened in Barrack, the coach that our tickets were assigned to was packed. Packed, full, standing room. No standing room, just people standing there staring at us. We have assigned seats in this coach, we stammered. Too bad. (laughs) Too bad. The people all jammed into that first class car said, try another car. And we did. We uh, looked at other cars, confused, annoyed, and yes, already hungry. And we saw all these busy cars. But then the conductor is yelling, get in or don't get in. (laughs) So we got in. We got into the car with a door next to us and we got about four or five steps in and that's where we stood for uh, five and a half hours. Should have only been about a three hour train ride, but 
it turned out to be five and a half hours. We stood body to body, pressed up against each other and the rest of humanity in the area of the train where you enter, the doors are, and where the bathrooms are. Now, that was one of the most unpleasant experiences that I've had in quite a while. But, but even then, even then, I still knew, well, I'm going to London. I knew one way or another, we're heading to London. Because whatever happened, I would, we, we would, my husband and I, we would just have to figure it out, right? Whether we got off the train or stayed on it or slept in this train station until the morning train or tried to rent a car, we would just keep making decisions, the best decisions we could make to get to our next destination on our journey, which was three nights in London. Now, that did not mean that I loved where I was for five and a half hours standing jowl to jowl with all sorts of people. And if you had asked me at 1 p.m. whether it was even uh, physically possible, if I were even physically capable of doing that a day after getting crunched in the train doors in Edinburgh, which I've talked about here before, if you had asked me if I could do it, I would have said, of course not. But I did it. (laughs) And my husband did it and everybody else on that train did it. And if you have to be standing cheek by jowl in a train ever. I hope you have the decent, positive people around you that we did. Real testament to people making the best of a physically and emotionally taxing situation. It was a journey. I had planned it carefully. I'd been on time. I'd done all the right things. And it was pretty unpleasant. And every minute minute by minute, we had the option of making it way worse or making it a little better. Every single person in that train had that option of making things in every minute, in every moment, a little better or a little worse. One comment at a time, one laugh at a time, one, excuse me, I need to move a little bit or uh, I need to stretch a tiny bit. One effort to move over for someone who needed to use the restroom at a time. Now, if I had, if my fellow travelers had sulked and cried and argued and pushed and angrily complained and blamed each other and cursed the rail system, yeah, it would have been harder for all of us. Much, much harder, probably longer. Our mission, right? Our mission for those five and a half hours, our mission, if we chose to accept it, was to practice patience and some kindness and some breathing and keeping calm. No snacks, no water, nowhere to sit. Right here, right now. This is your life. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. We were where we were, right? And thinking, I should be in a comfy assigned seat with my husband having a nice lunch, watching the countryside roll by or catching up on a little reading that we paid so much extra for. Yeah, that bubbled up in my brain now and then. But nothing would have changed, would it? Nothing. Just a quick look around and I could see where we were. (laughs) where we were and that's what we were dealing with thinking I should be somewhere else would not help me deal with what was going on right here right now if when you catch yourself thinking you should be further elsewhere if when you catch yourself thinking you shouldn't still be in this situation or struggling with this skill or that you should have made a different plan or accomplished more by now or that this is some sort of evidence that you are always a day late and a dollar short Your situation doesn't change. But your agility and your problem solving, your creativity and flexibility and compassion for yourself and others, when you're thinking that way, it tanks. It tanks. If my assessment of where I am right now, the situation I'm in, if my assessment means I'm broken and 
inadequate and I'm never the one with the brass ring and this is some sort of cosmic example of my dumb ideas and what's wrong with me and the time I've wasted, the stupid decisions I've made, my attention deficit. If that's how I'm concentrating, nothing would really change except for my experience and the experience of everyone around me right here and right now. This is your life! Right here! Right now! Right here! Right now! Maybe I shouldn't be anywhere but where I am. Maybe you shouldn't be anywhere but where you are. Because where you are right now is the only place you have any power. Where I am right now is the only place I have any leverage. Even, even, I know a lot of my listeners like to uh, take things I say and put them into an extreme example, but even if we're in some sort of grave danger, bemoaning and judging and feeling defeated is not going to help any of us make life-saving decisions. It's not going to help us call for help or fight for what we need or make anything safer. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. What's the next choice you can make with what's available? How can you show up? How can I show up? How can we be who we know we are right here, right now? Every journey has red lights and road work, reckless drivers in the next lane, engine trouble, bad smells, closed exits, inclement weather. Your vegan journey, your academic journey, your health journey, fitness journey, creative journey, your career journey, wherever you are, wherever you are, right here, right now, I'd like you to try on the idea that you're in the right place. Because thinking you should be elsewhere is kind of a waste of time. Don't you think? All solutions, all great ideas, all acts of service and love happen right here. They happen right now. So, thank you. Thank you all, my Veg Your Bestie, for being with me on this ride to 150 consecutive weekly episodes of Veg Your Best Podcast. You know, it occurs to me to quit now and then too. <laughs> You know, uh, I've, I've had a challenging couple of months in terms of keeping up with things and um, doing all the things in my life and showing up for all the people in my life that I want to and still do this. And, you know, I feel like a failure often and what I'm doing is not enough. And it's always because my focus has time traveled, you know, it's because I'm thinking about something that's not right here and right now. Oh, this is your life! Right here! Right now! Right here! Right now! Right here! Right now! Right here! Right now! Right here, right now. That's where everything happens. Okay, kids. I will see you next week. And until then, veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So, until next week, make it easy and veg your best.